Hi, yeah. Um, my name is Nico, or Nicholas Matsaki. Nicholas Matsakis, but I usually go by Nico. And I wanted to talk to you about some things that I've been learning uh, about how to write compilers and that I thought were interesting. Um, it's like when I started writing compilers, which was not that long ago, but well, when I was an undergrad and I took my first compiler course, I don't know. Uh, we were, we were using books like this, right? <clears throat> and, I, and I kind of learned this classic structure um, of how to write a compiler, which was all about passes, right? Where you would say, OK, what we're going to do when we write a compiler is we're going to take the input, we're going to lex it and produce tokens, and those tokens are going to get parsed, and that's going to give us an AST. And then we're going to do a series of things to this AST. We're going to semantically analyze it, for example, looking up all the names and resolve them to symbols. And we're going to do our type check, and we're going to do optimizations in some sort of loop. Um, and you know, that's all. That's a really good structure for a compiler that is still the kind of main way that the compilers I've worked on have been written. And it's exactly how the Rust compiler was written um, when I first started working on it. It's actually kind of still how the Rust compiler is written, because it's really hard to port a big piece of software to a new approach. But we've been moving to a new model, and I've been hearing about and talking with people about a new, a sort of different way to write a compiler. And, and that's what I wanted to, to sort of talk about. And the reason that there's a change is because the way that you interact with compilers has changed, right? Um, when Rust, like the way the Rust compiler was written and the way the compilers usually worked was this sort of batch compilation model where you run it and you process the whole source and you produce an output and maybe you get an error out of it. But these days, you know, most people are working with VS Code or IDEs or something like that, and you really want a different way to, to, to interact with the source when you're in this model because you want to be able to take messed up inputs, make sense of them. You want to be able to do completions and jump to definitions and things in an interactive way, and you need that. Uh, you need to kind of not necessarily process the whole source to do that, but just process enough to kind of answer the user's query. And so what I was trying to do today, or what I originally thought I would do today, let's say, is say, well, what if you were writing this compiler book today? What would it look like? And the first thing I would say is, you know, I'm kind of a pacifist, and so I don't think I would have this, like, this f combat-oriented thing. But I, liked, I found this picture online, and that was more my, my speed. And I thought we'd just, like, change the title. <laughs> or like, OK. Um, so yeah, oh yeah, lesson, don't use LALR, by the way. You can just use LR1 these days. But anyway, <laughs> no. But, but actually, I think I'm not, I don't think I will actually tell you how. You will see that I think there are more question marks than answers. We don't have all the things written down to make the perfect book. Maybe other people do. Uh, I don't, personally. But I have a lot of, let's put it as experiences that I can share of what we've tried and not tried and so on, and some of the challenges. Um, and I think the first thing to learn about this uh, about this whole environment today is that there's been a big shift in the last couple years, basically, in the way that IDEs are written. And that was that Microsoft introduced VS Code, which is an amazing editor. But among the many amazing things that it introduced, one of them is the language server protocol, um, which is basically an intermediate protocol for interfacing between the language that's being compiled and the editor that's interacting, right? So that neither have to be tied to one another. It used to be that we would write, you know, when you wrote like an Eclipse plugin for your language, it just worked in Eclipse, right? And then if you wanted to extend for NetBeans or something, you would extend for NetBeans and Emacs and VI and so on. But LSP actually lets you kind of sidestep that, right? And so, for example, in, in the Rust compiler, we have a language service. We actually have two. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and they work you know, for Emacs, VI, VS Code, whatever. Um, well, the Emacs support is, the Emacs LSP implementations are a little iffy, I find, but it kind of works. Uh, and so that's a, pretty, that's a pretty useful sort of thing. Right? But what you wind up with in this model, instead of having the compiler be something that you run on the command line, it's more of an actor. The editor is kind of sending you diffs 
to the files that you're compiling, and you're responding to them uh, and sending back diagnostics, and it might say, okay, we want to know what are the completions at this point, and your compiler has to go send back a vector of responses. Um, so you wind up with a pretty different structure. And the main thing that, we, that you have to do is to think about what is sort of the minimum information you need to answer that request, and can you just process that so that you can get back responses as fast as possible. Right, so instead of a type checker that walks all the sources and does all the things uh, for all the functions, you might say, well, okay, I only need to type check this statement. How much context do I need to do that? Can I go back out to the function? I have to go to other functions sometimes, but not all of them, find their signatures, and so on. Um, and that, that's a pretty different way of looking at the project. So what we've been trying to do um, is move to a kind of demand-driven architecture, where you have a given goal that you need to do, and that goal is implemented by some function that kind of uses other functions, and you go backwards, but you always try to keep this, this set relatively minimum. And so at the end of the day, you still have these traditional compiler passes kind of logically, but you might not be executing them completely, and you might not be executing them in a, in a fixed order. Um, and I think if I were you and I were trying to write a compiler, I would, this is kind of roughly my reaction when I was learning about all this. It's like, this is hard enough as it is. Like, why should I deal with this too, right? Unless you have a production use case or something. Um, and that's fair. I think you can react that way. But there are some things I've noticed in trying to, to make this transformation that surprised me. Um, and there are some reasons, I think, to try to do an IDE-friendly approach, even if it's not a full IDE implementation from the beginning. Um, the first one, of course, is that you know, it's cool <laughs> to have a VS Code plugin that works and interactively works with your language, even if it's like a research language. It's just a nice um, way to show it off and get people interested. But the other thing I've noticed, and this is one of the things that surprised me, is that it can really, I think, inform your language design, actually, because it, you become much more aware of what dependencies you need to figure out bits of information, and that might lead you to, to do or not do uh, certain decisions. I'll give you an example in a bit. Um, oh, I'll give you an example right now. So, <laughs> so here's an example of something that I would not have done had we had an IDE, or at least I think I would, uh, we would not have done from the beginning. So Rust has always allowed, um, Rust being the programming language that I'm working on at Mozilla, for those of you who don't know about it, um, and it has always allowed you to nest things kind of arbitrarily since before I got there. I don't know, it's just, it just seemed like it made sense, I guess. So for example, you can have a function with a struct inside of it can you all see this in the back, by the way? Can I make it bigger? OK. And that's kind of handy, because sometimes you want to have a temp, like some local data that's not needed outside of this function. Um, so you could make a struct in there, and that, that's fine. You can also do things like put methods on that struct. So this, this impl bar, that's Rust notation for implement methods for the type bar. And you can add methods there. And but what that means is, I could actually have a struct that's visible from outside the function, and I could put methods on it inside the function, and now um, uh, I can call those methods from outside the function, because the methods are dispatched based on the type, and we sort of attached the method here to the type bar, and if I have an instance of bar from outside the function, I can call it. And now what that means is, if I'm doing completions on a value of type bar, I really need to, like, parse the inside of my function bodies to figure out if there is an impl uh, in there that might be relevant, or else I won't get those methods. Now, does anyone do this in practice? I don't know, actually. Yeah? Uh, is the method being attached to a free function invocation? Is it matched to, attached to a? Attached, so the method yes. attached to the type bar on every time we uh, invoke the foo. Yes. So, uh, Right, so you're asking, is the method, if I understand you're saying, like, is the method scoped to the function foo, or is it kind of global in scope? Is that the question? Uh, no, the question is, so if I call foo two times. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I'm declaring the method twice. Oh, I see. So if, the way it works in Rust, anyway, is this, this nesting of 
items like this. There is actually no connect, like the only thing it affects is resolving names. So the, the method here from bar doesn't, it's not able to use, for example, any of the parameters or local variables from foo. It's not uh, a closure, it's just nested in there. Um, right, so this was sort of done, I think this was semi-arbitrary that we decided to permit this. Basically, we had always permitted things to be nested. Then we added methods, and they sh why not? But if we had been working with an ID framework from the start, I think we might have noticed that this was happening and said, well, maybe we should like, be a little more restrictive because nobody actually really wants to probably, I shouldn't say nobody, but it's not a high use case to embed a public method inside a function body where it's kind of high hidden. Um, um, and the other reason that, that kind of led us in this direction is that, in fact, in most compilers that I've wound up working in, if you have a strict phase separation where you say, I'm going to fully resolve all the symbols and then type check all the bodies and then do this thing, it winds up being kind of constraining uh, at the end of the day. And you, you often need to process your source in, in a sort of difficult order, right? And this is kind of, I, I said here it's impossible to have strict phase separation. That's obviously not true. It's possible. It's a constraint. Maybe it's a constraint you want. But basically what I'm saying is in many languages, I think it's a constraint you don't want. Um, and I'll give you an example from Rust to start. So Rust allows you to have constants. Like here we have the constant length, which is defined as 1 plus 1 plus 1. And then we have a data constant, which is an array. And we specified the length as being the constant len, so 3. right? And I can do this. And that, but what this means now is that there is this kind of uh, interdependency. In order to know the full type of data, I have to evaluate the constant len. In order to evaluate the constant len, I have to type check its body and execute it in some way and sort of uh, interpret it symbolically, execute it, whatever, to figure out what its value is. Um, and that means I can't sort of fully type check all the constants and uh, because in, or, uh, sort of in one order without considering the dependencies between them, right? Because I have to type check and, and evaluate len before I can even figure out the type of data in full. And what we used to do to handle this is some horrible hacks, basically, where we essentially had like a two implementations uh, of, of some parts of code in the compiler because we needed to have a sort of subset of the type checker and evaluator that was good enough to evaluate something like len and that could execute at any point on demand. And then we had the real code that did the, the full check that came after. Um, and it was a horrible pain, basically. Um, and now, as in this more demand-based system, this just isn't a problem, because we can sort of go and execute len on its own. Right? And it also, usually when, when you're doing this sort of thing, you wind up needing to detect things like cycles and so on also. Uh, and this kind of falls out from the framework we're working on, basically. So if you have here, if my len constant accessed data, that would be actually considered illegal, at least in Rust today, uh, because you can't access a thing whose type you don't know, and we were needed to know the type. Um, I think some similar examples that you might, where uh, other examples of phase separation, do I have a slide on this? Yeah. That, that I've seen, or kind of that come to mind, are things like, well, of course, in some languages, like ML or whatever, you have kind of inferred types across function boundaries that can make that a little bit tricky. Um, and in Rust, there's a bunch of things in the logic language. Uh, one that I remember from, if you ever tried to read the sources of Java C uh, and, and thought carefully about how many different things that the dot operator does in Java, uh, you will find that there's like a bunch of laziness happening there because basically the sets of classes that a given class can touch is kind of determined by as you walk through and compile. Um, and, uh, and also, I think, I don't know a lot about this last one, but I remember reading some interesting papers about how Racket and deals with things like phase separation, and it all seems pretty relevant. So I think from a lot of languages, what you find is you want to evaluate some subsets of the source uh, and type check and be able to work with them without necessarily processing the whole thing. OK, so that's my, my sort of the introduction. So what, what have we been actually doing to solve this? Um, we're taking a particular approach, uh, which is based on a framework 
that is called salsa. Um, and the idea here is it's, it's kind of a enabling you to still write your compiler in a general purpose programming language that feels roughly familiar. Um, I think the other major, I guess th there's kind of two different alternatives to what we're doing that I'm going to talk about. And one of them, which is the one I wrote on top, the hand-coded version, is what I've seen more in, in practice in other places. And that's basically not having a framework, but thinking very carefully and doing, all, doing the same things, but just doing it open-coded, right? By hand, figuring out, oh, if I'm going to type check this, I need to have these dependencies and making it work. And that is, of course, very practical. It just can have bugs, um, in incremental inconsistencies and so on, where you forgot about a dependency between things. And then the other technique would be to go a little more formal and build everything out of like attribute grammars or data log structured queries or things like that, a higher level expression. Uh, that's a really cool thing. It just means that then you have to make sure everything you do fits into that framework and extend the framework appropriately. So we've been shooting for a sort of middle ground. Um, and the high level idea of this framework is that you have, you separate out the inputs to your compilation, and then a bunch of derived stuff. Right? And the derived queries are basically pure functions that get to demand other, so other results. We call them queries, but they get to demand other things that they need, some of which might be inputs. Right? And we track, when we execute one of these functions, we can track what bits of data did it use, and, uh, and ultimately which inputs did it use. And then when there's a change to one of the inputs, we can propagate those changes and, and try to avoid re-executing things. And, and there's a lot of systems that are in this space that are related. Um, I think Adapton, the three that I know of that are closest, two of them are kind of academic, which would be the Adapton uh, approach from Matthew Hammer and Build Systems a la carte, which was a paper by Simon Peyton Jones and some other people whose names are not sure at the moment, um, but that did a lot of uh, they built a, built a very flexible system in Haskell that has a similar basis. Um, the difference would be, I guess, that ours is somewhere in between those two. The build systems a la carte allowed you to customize a lot of different things and tweak a lot of area aspects of the approach. And Adapton is uh, just a little more a little more flexible, but also therefore more complicated. Um, and an interesting one in the middle is this is, a, is the Glimmer engine. So the Ember web framework does incremental updates. Uh, and they use an engine called Glimmer that turns out to be very similar. Uh, and actually, I think, I haven't looked deeply at what React does or these other web frameworks, but I imagine that they also are kind of related. Um, so that, uh, it turns out this is a problem that applies to a lot of areas, right? Not just compilation. So when you're writing a program in Salsa, it kind of looks like this. You construct a database. That's this part here. Um, and then you can, essentially, you have a loop, right? where you set some inputs, and that, that's like when you get a diff from the, from, the, uh, from the editor, and you compute some derived values. Uh, and the idea is that these things are memoized, so whenever you ask for a derived value, it will always be up to date for whatever the latest input changes that you've made. Um, so when you, when you really try to write a whole compiler with this kind of model, one of the things well, one of the things that arises is this, this relationship to entity component systems. Um, this is kind of a right turn, but I want to explain it as a sort of background, uh, as a way to think about how these queries feel in practice. So how many people have heard of an entity component system, out of curiosity? OK, some. So, so an entity component system is something that arises mostly out of game programming, as I understand it. And it's basically an alternative to object-oriented programming, in a way. Uh, you can think of it that way where you separate out the data and the identity. And so in, in an object-oriented program, the identity of a, like your, you have a class and you make an instance of it, and all of its data and all of its operations are defined at that moment when you created it. Right? Whereas in an entity component system, you create a new entity and it has nothing associated with it but just like a number, essentially an ID. And then you can have separately data that gets attached to it. And this, is like, this makes things very flexible. So in games, this is useful because you might have like I don't know, a rock. A lot of things have positions, like rocks and people and so on. And so you can have positions attached to them. But then 
people might also have additional attributes like players that connect them. And then it turns out that, oh, at some point the, the, the rock can be controlled by a user. So now I can just attach a control to the rock, uh, just that one rock and not all rocks. And this kind of thing. It, makes, it allows you to be, to be very uh, unstructured. In a compiler, I think that part of it is not as important, but it's, it's still pretty useful. And so what you wind up with is a system, at least the way we've been doing it, where you have this the entity kind of corresponds to something like a symbol, like a function or a struct, what's often called a symbol, or a field, something that gets declared in, in, the, in the program language, right? And you kind of layer on different bits of data about this symbol. So it might have a type and so on. And the reason you layer these on is this is what allows us to be so demand driven. So we can ask for the type of a symbol and get that without having all the other bits of data that might eventually come to be associated with it. Um, right, so there are a couple different things. The type is one, signature would be another. Um, and sometimes there are more like unit results or like lists of errors. So the, the result of applying some analysis that can reject. Uh, so what it, what it looks like, the, the basic structure of this salsa system is that you have queries, um, which are, have a name. It's actually, this is where, uh, it's not quite an entity component system in that we don't have a formal concept of entities. Instead, what we have is a query, which is kind of a component. Um, so a query name might be something like the type or the signature. And then we have a, se a set of keys that go into that query. Uh, and those, often there's only one, right? So the type of a given, sig a given function or the type of a given variable. But sometimes there's more than one. So there can be kind of any number. And, uh, and when you execute this query, you're going to get back some value, right? And that value is just is the result. Um, of these things, the keys and the value are all have to be, uh, basically, they have to be values in the sense that they can be copied, and they have an, uh, an e you know, you can compare them for equality, and if that's true, then they're equivalent in all ways. They're transparent, uh, simple values, essentially. So. Here are some examples of the kinds of queries that we might have, right? They kind of range from, at the very top, these, these base inputs, like what is the input text? What is the source in this particular file? And then the derived things like an AST or a signature. And then at the very end would be things like the, the high-level operations, like, OK, the cursor is at this file, at this line, and this column. What is the set of strings we want to display to the user as possible completions? Um, so it, they kind of run the whole range. And the way that we declare them, it, it, you wind up structuring your program uh, into these, these sort of groups of queries. Um, so basically, they, you can think of it as a kind of interface. Right? You're declaring that the database of data is going to have these range of operations. And some of them are inputs. These are the things you can explicitly set and the rest are derived. So we might say, what is the AST associated with a given file? Right? And it's going to give back an AST, um, and so on. And so you see that I have different kinds of parameters at different points, like the signature of some entity in the system um, is that. It doesn't. So why do I separate the inputs from the deriving functions? It's because it's not, it doesn't matter for the interface. They both uh, appear to be functions that you can invoke. But the, the actual implementation of this, this is, a, this is kind of a procedural macro. Um, and it's going to generate some glue code and memoization code and things like that. And so for inputs, it, it generates different things. It, it also generates a setter, I should say. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, so when you, when you have the input queries, basically, what you wind up with essentially is a kind of hash map that's storing your base data, right? And you can, the, this, the framework will automatically generate a setter that you can invoke to set the value, and you can also just use it like a method to get the value. Um, the derived queries are a little bit different. So for each one, uh, you basically give a function. And this function, 
takes the first argument is always the database. And let me explain that, that notation. So this is a Rust notation. What it means is some type that implements this trait or interface. All right, so basically, you don't know. This function only gets to work with the methods and things that were exposed in that, in that interface. That's all it has access to. Um, and then these other arguments are the inputs, the query keys. And the reason that this is important, or one, one subtle point that is important, I guess, is that in Rust, if you have a top-level function like this, it has access to nothing else. Right? Uh, it doesn't have, I mean, you can make mutable global data if you really want to. But it's difficult. Um, but, <laughs> but basically, it's constrained in what it can access. And this is pretty important, because we went through a couple iterations in our compiler, let's say. Uh, and of diff we, we've basically done three different incremental systems, I think, at this point. Yeah, one really failed early, one that we kind of got to work, but it didn't work that well. And that's the one that I'm thinking of, where we weren't as strict about this. Because I thought, eh, like, how hard can it be to make sure you don't access things you're not supposed to access? Uh, it turns out it's really hard. And there was lots of subtle leaks uh, of information where, it where we were actually using data that we thought it would be OK to read it, but it, it was influenced in some way by earlier phases of the compilation. And we had a lot of bugs. Uh, and that, that, that version never made it to, to users. Uh, and so then we rewrote a third time, and we took this much stricter approach, where when you um, implement something, you really don't have access to anything that is not tracked in some way. Uh, and that was much better, though it did require a lot of rewriting. Right? So it's kind of the equivalent of putting a type system onto your language, basically. Um, so what the actual implementation, I'm going to dive a little bit into what happens here. The idea is when you invoke one of these methods to, to compute some value, I mentioned earlier that it's kind of memoized. You can think of it within a given revision. If you, don't make, if you never change the inputs, you can think of it as just a big memoization system. So you invoke one of these methods. We're going to look up if we've computed it before. And if so, we'll just give you the value. And otherwise, we'll execute your function uh, and give you the value when it's done. And we're going to track looking for cycles while we do that. Because when we execute one function, it might invoke other queries. So then we can detect if there's some kind of cyclic dependency and, and report that out. Um, that's what we do within one revision. But then across revisions, we also track what the dependencies were. So when one thing executed another, we can, we can track that and use that to figure out what might have changed. And the data that we use to do this is basically uh, we have a global revision counter. We have a map, like a hash map, for every query. And that maps the, the, the key to the, to the stuff we need. Right? And that's, that's both the result. It's the vector of dependencies. And it's a kind of revision that's tracking in what version did this last change. Um, so th when you initially computed, that's just the current reversion, revision. But we'll see as we go later on that it's not always equal to the current revision. Um, and so the basic idea is the sort of simplest idea would be something like this. Um, when you invoke a given query, you can check if it's out of scope. And otherwise, you can walk over those dependencies and see, check if any of them have changed. What did they transitively depend on? Has it changed since the last revision? Um, and if so, re-execute. Right? And this is kind of like what make does, if you think about it. If you think about make, it has this some dependency graph that it figures out. right? And then if some file, if the, if the, the timestamp is newer, it's going to invalidate eagerly everything reachable from that function uh, and recompute it, or from that file, and, and recompute, right? re-execute the compiler. And this, that's what you would effectively get if you did it this way. This is, again, something we tried the first time in our first version that never made it out. And we'll see that it has some, some problems, but it, it basically works. So I can kind of give you an example of what, might, what would happen here. If you were computing the signature of something and you're in revision 1, um, let's say to compute the signature of a function, what would we have to do? We would have to figure out, first we have to go and, and f invoke db.ast, and that's going to give us the AST for the function. Um, and then when we have the AST, well, to get the AST, that, how do we get the AST? It has to parse the input that the function is in. 
And to parse the input, we need the input. So we would presumably invoke db.input text. And at that point, we get, this is kind of the, the, the call stack, right? At that point, we get to an actual um, uh, input. So we can say we know what revision it's in. It's just whatever revision it was last set. And that gets propagated up. Um, and so at each point, yeah? So the question, input text is effectively more or less than the inner HTML attribute in JavaScript, or then you can change the HTML of an element to do things? Um, so it's effectively, the input text is effectively like the source in JavaScript, you're saying? Like of an HTML DOM or something like that? Uh, yes. For instance, the, you know, the, the HTML to the uh, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like that. You could think of it like that in this system. I think the difference would be, mm, the difference might be this, that the input text is, would be for the entire file, usually. And some of the other things you're computing might not be on the whole file. So you might be getting the signature of some function. In order to get, we'll kind of talk about this in a little more, I think, but in order to get the signature of a particular function, you would have to get the AST of a particular function. In order to get the AST of a particular function, you have to find the input text for the whole file that it's in, which kind of you can parse. The, maybe you can parse parts of the file, but usually you would parse the whole file. And then you can extract out just the AST, part of the AST that you need, and propagate that back out. And so th the point being that you don't actually have the, the source tokens, at least not trivially, for a particular function. You would have more of the source tokens for the whole file. But you can usually you'll track position information so that if you needed them, you could subset it so out. So input text more or less returns the slides because the raster. Um, no, it returns the whole function is what I'm saying. But you might later extract out a slice or something. Sorry, it returns the whole file, but you might extract out a slice. Yeah. Um, right. So, so now, you know, we we have this dependency information. So if we go to a new revision, when we go to recompute the signature. Um, we would notice that the AST is out of date because its revision is too, is too old, right? It has an input uh, that is newer than, than its revision, and we would recompute it. Um, but what happens a lot with this system, of course, is that the actual change that you made doesn't really matter. Um, so the simplest example is suppose I added a comment, right, into the function. Uh, now, Basically, when we go back to our change, the actual AST that results is going to be the same either way, whether or not there's a comment in there. And so it's kind of silly then to re-execute all the things that depend on that AST. So the actual algorithm that we use has this one, one little twist to it, which says, re-execute the function, but then check if the new result you got from re-executing is actually different. And if it's not, you can just leave things the way they are, and otherwise you update. Right? And this is pretty important in the end for making things really work. Because, right, so, so if we apply this, what will happen is we'll see that the AST is the same. We won't update the revision in which we changed. So the AST is still considered to have changed in revision one, and then the signature is not dirty and can be reused. And those things are probably not that important, but hopefully there's later computations like, big, like type checks and so on that actually are. Um, and so the really convenient part about this is that you can sort of do this projection where you extract out the bits you actually needed uh, and use that to, to constrain changes um, from propagating too far. So some subtle points about this basic algorithm is that the first thing is that order matters a lot. You, you don't want to just, when you're checking to see if something's out of date, you actually have to check it in the same order that it executed in the first place or else you might be doing things that should never have happened. Right, so if we have an example here where there's a function A that invokes a function B and then conditionally invokes either C or D, depending on the result. Um, if B is true, then our list of dependencies in the first revision might be sort of A invoked B and it invoked C because B was true. But in the second revision, if we find out that B has changed, uh, we don't, what we don't want to do is go check if C is up to date before we've checked B, right? Because it may be that C should never have been invoked in the first place, right? If B has already changed, we just have to stop uh, and re-execute the function because it could go through some other path. 
So you just have, you have to keep that in mind. And the second part is that, um, or you can, I didn't say this explicitly, but we also track a sort of, we don't just track when did it last changed, but we track when did we last check if it has, when did we last update and check this value. Uh, that basically ensures that we never recompute something more than once in a given revision. So you know that at any point it's kind of linear over the set of things. Um, and finally, we, you do have to worry about garbage collection. <laughs> uh, because if you think back to this A, B, C example, like the first round, the function A wound up invoking the function C, and we memoize that. But if in some later execution, that function may never get invoked, and we still have this memoized value kind of hanging around that we might want to, because we're thinking maybe we'll want to reuse it later. Um, so that, that requires you to collect these old results at some point. And it turns out you can do this in a kind of nice way, because we're already tracking for all the memoized values the revision when we last computed them, when they were last checked if they were up to date or not. And so essentially what you can do is you do some sort of, uh, let's say your master query, whatever it is, like type check all the functions. And then at the end of that, you can just sweep through the memoized values and say, did that wind up being recomputed in the most recent revision or not? And if it didn't, then you know it's something that's no longer needed, or at least was not needed to do that master query, and you can throw it away. And the nice part of this, of course, is these are all you know, fully functional, pure things that were derived. So at the end of the day, if you throw something away that you might want later, it doesn't really matter, um, because you can always recompute it. And in fact, we've been finding more and more that you know, computation is cheap. Sometimes it's better to just throw away everything, uh, even if you know you're going to need it later, because you might as well recompute it. Um, so that's an interesting point of, like, uh, let's say, a place where we have been playing around with what the right strategy is. But so when you're done, you kind of get this picture where you have a graph of computation, and what you really want to do is re-execute the early steps, but, but cut it off as quickly as you can. Right? Um, so when you're doing this uh, approach, one of the things you have to do is separate out. You don't, you don't want to have all the, thing, all the different bits of data that you're going to compute all packaged together into one data structure. So I mentioned entity component systems and so on earlier. Uh, that's really relevant here because let's say you have a parser that produces an AST. In a lot of compilers, you might have like a class for the AST node. And in that AST node, it would have, oh, when I name resolved this, what did I resolve it to? What is the type of this AST node? Sort of all stored as fields in the AST itself. But if you do that in this incremental system, that won't work so well because when we reparse the AST, we, of course, don't have those values anymore. Um, and you'd, the, you'd have to sort of port them uh, you just can't combine it, basically. You can't reuse, mix and match bits of data from different revisions that way. Um, so what we do instead is to sort of separate out the layers, and you wind up with essentially a lot of maps. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. Um, so you could imagine, for example, that if you have the AST for a given function, you can give each node in the AST an ID, right? A map, just an integer. And then you can produce, for name resolution, you can have a map that says, for the, the node with this ID, here's, the, here's what I resolved it to. Here's the symbol or entity. And for type checking, you might have a similar map that says, here's the type for that AST. Right? And this works pretty well. Um, it's, pretty, it's reasonably efficient. But there, it turns out that the way that you give these IDs actually matters a lot, too. Um, and that was something. It's like a trick that keeps coming up. And in the old Rust compiler, the old Rust compiler, before we made it incremental, um, also used a lot of maps. That's because it was written in a very functional style, so it didn't want to be mutating things. But it assigned the node IDs in a very simple way. It just did a walk of the entire AST for your whole program and gave them numbers, you know, pre-index of this walk. So 0, 1, 2, 3. This had a sort of downside, um, which is it was very simple. But if I modify, let's say, the function foo and add some more stuff into it, then all the IDs for the function bar are going to be different after that. Um, 
so that there's this contamination. And that obviously won't work with an incremental system, uh, or at least if you edit things early in the file, you'll have to do a lot of work recomputing stuff later on in the file, uh, and that's probably not what you wanted. So the, the basic trick here is to use trees. Um, and this is one of those tricks where I feel like as we do the design, we just keep coming across <laughs> this, this being a useful technique. Um, so what you do is instead of giving, instead of your ID being just a simple integer, it's some kind of path, right? And this path, it can be just, in, it can just be indexes or it can be something richer with names. It doesn't matter that much. But so this would be the simplest possible scheme. You might start it, you might say the first step is a file name. And then every, that, that's the base kind of entity that can be in your system, is a whole file. But then within that, you can sort of nest, right? So the function foo might be like uh, represented as dot zero, and dot one would be the function bar. And then within there, we have further numbers, right? And now, of course, we have the advantage that changing the contents of foo doesn't affect the numbers of bar in any way. Um, and what we actually do in the compiler is like a little bit different. So the, the main downside of this, of this index scheme is if I add a new function, like if I put a function in between foo and bar, now the, the index of bar has changed, and so we'd have to recompute things about bar. And maybe that's a problem, maybe it's not. Like I said, it turns out you know, the computer's pretty fast. Like that might not be actually that big a deal. But if you wanted to avoid it, you can use names, right? And then, uh, and now, like, uh, as long as we insert a new function in between, as long as it has a different name, it's OK. Um, the problem with names, of course, is then you have to deal with incorrect programs. And, or you might have two things with the same name, which might or might not be correct, but you have to deal with that possibility. So what we actually use in the compiler is we have this extra index. So we use names, but we give them an index, and then when the same name appears more than once, we increment the index. And that's usually an, actually an error, but we still need to keep going so that we can give you feedback. Um, but it lets us sort of have a unique ID. And sometimes it's not an error, because there are certain things that are anonymous, for example. Um, that, that works pretty well in practice. Uh, I don't know what I was, oh, yeah, OK. Forget that. So you have these big trees, and that that's great, but you have to actually pass them around and so forth. And if you had like a garbage collected language, I guess that's not such a big deal. You can sort of allocate them. But you probably do wind up creating a lot of the same tree over and over. So what we do is we have also the, like the last piece of this system is a kind of interning mechanism. It's basically there to handle, to turn these big trees into little integers and go back and forth, right? And so you can reference this integer. You, you basically intern the way you'd represent it in, in, in Rust is that the whole path is represented as an integer, um, a new typed integer. So it has a struct that wraps it around it so that we can give it a meaningful type. And then this is the actual data, which is recursive, but it goes through the interning system. right? So the recursive step references the, the, a, a previously interned value. Um, and then we have a special interning mechanism that can convert the data into a new one. And we can actually track those dependencies, too. And thus, if, for example, some function is renamed or parts of the system are different, we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, but uh, the other advantage of this, this entity-based approach, or this, this tree-based identifier approach, is that you get some context. Um, because it turns out you, you often really need this kind of context. So, if you think about some of the examples I gave earlier, when you're computing the signature of a given entity, I sort of said, I think I hand wove it and said something like, to compute the signature of a function, we have to look at the AST of, a f of that function. But then I said that the AST is, is, is only one AST per file. We, uh, we kind of talked about this. And the question would be, how do I get from this function to that file? How do I know what file the function is in, right, in the first place? And there are different ways to do it, but one way that works really well if you have this tree-based approach is that it's, it's right there in the identifier, basically. You can walk up the ID and find the root of it is some file, and you can, you can get the file from there. Um, so the, the other big technique 
that comes up a lot is the ability to tighten your queries, right? So, so far what we have, basically, we have this, this, this system that lets you write a bunch of queries, it tracks the interdependencies. The nice part about it is it's guaranteed to sort of be correct. It'll only recompute, or it will always give you a refreshed value, but it might actually do a lot of recomputation if your queries are very broad, right? And this particular query setup that I showed here is an example where it might be too broad in practice. You have to try it and see. Because what's, what you're going to wind up doing here is recomputing the signature of the function whenever anything in the file changes, because this AST is for the entire file. Um, and that's, maybe that's OK, or maybe it's not. Right? And what, what you can do if you find that you're recomputing something too often is you can insert a sort of intermediate query to do a projection or a narrowing or some sort of transformation. Right? And so maybe I have a query that says, give me the AST just for this one function. And all that does is find the function and pull it out um, from the bigger AST. But the advantage of this is that if the bigger AST changes, uh, all I have to re-execute is the code that finds and extracts the one smaller piece of AST, and I won't have to do any of the dependent operations. Um, so that, that kind of uh, is, is basically just a, a handy thing that you can do while you're looking, um, while you're optimizing. Yeah. How many queries approximately are there now for us to find? I don't know. There's a lot. <laughs> um, probably not thousands. It's probably more. It's probably hundreds. But um, we are, we are sort of. I think we have more. Yeah, it's definitely hundreds. One of, one of the things the Rust compiler is is actually using a slightly different version of this system. So this is like an idealized version of the Rust compiler that has been extracted to a library, uh, and. We are actually using it. We have a s there's a separate effort to build an IDE, like an IDE first compiler for Rust that we have to figure out how to bridge the two. It's another story. But that is using this framework. And I'm not sure how many queries they have, but they're not complete yet. The Rust framework is using a slightly different one. But in any case, I think it has on the order of hundreds. But the reason I mention <laughs> that we're not using it is one of the problems we had in the Rust compiler is that we didn't support any kind of modules. And the number of queries did indeed grow very large. And it's just annoying, if nothing else, but also hard to read the source because they're all in like one huge list. Um, and so this system, part of the reason that, that everything is by interfaces and so on is exactly so that you can modularize the queries and say, here's the stuff for the parser, and here's the type checker, and they depend on one another, and so on. Um, but it does, it does grow quite large, I would say. Um, so one of the questions, I think what I, when I've been working with this system, it seems very clear when you look at any individual function how it's supposed to work. And it's kind of clear when you think about at the outer level, OK, I'm going to make a query like, give me the completions. But getting from give me the completions at this point to those intermediate queries that actually know what entities there are and can think about the type checking and all that stuff is kind of challenging. It's like a quantum mechanics thing or something. It all makes sense at the two extremes, but the middle is confusing. Um, so I thought it would be useful to just sort of walk over this, this spine, how it all connects. Um, this is an example of how you might do it. So if you were, say, computing what are all the errors in the project, that's, that's, a, that's kind of a query you would likely have for your IDE. You might start by saying, give me all the file names in the project. right? And that's probably just a base input. Um, and then, then you can kind of iterate over each file and have something that says, give me all the entities, which would go through, which would have to parse them, parse the AST, and walk the AST and extract just the IDs and return them to you. Right? And then you can walk through and type check all the entities. And by this point, once you're in this, this round of like, getting the AST for a given entity and so on. Then it becomes, again, fairly clear this is like your standard code, because now you have the identifiers you need for all the things. Um, but the, I left out some steps here for sure, like type checking would probably have to get the AST, but it would also need to get the name resolution results and, and things like that. Um, but they fit into this framework. Right? And so having this, 
Now we can sort of walk through and see, well, what happens in this complete picture if the user edits a comment, right, like I showed. And the answer might be as simple as, well, we ha we've done one revision, so we have all this MOI's data, let's say. Um, and if the user edits a comment, we can rewalk it, and we see that we have to rerun the parser. But once we rerun the parser, the AST that results is the same. So we just stop, right? And we, we, we can keep all the type checks intact. Um, but if the user edits a single function body, then we would have to rerun the parser. It would not be the same, because they did actually edit a function body. So the AST is different. Um, so in that case, we would have to, as we're doing the type checking, for, for each, we would extract out one by one what is the AST for any given function. Uh, and we'll find that only one of them has changed. So we'll wind up rerunning the type checker, but just for that one function, right? Um, and so we wind up redoing a pretty reasonably minimal amount of work uh, overall. Now, you meant, uh, there was a question of how many queries there are in the compiler. And I mentioned memory use. So one of the things I would add is that in practice, uh, you, you may not actually want to keep all of this memoized data around for all of your queries, because it can be quite a large graph. But there's a lot of different tricks you can do. So one of the things we do in the compiler is we only keep the hash, actually. We don't keep the full value. Um, so we can still re-execute, and we can still see if it has changed, uh, because it's a cryptographic hash, so it's at least as good as SHA-1 or whatever. Um, and we know if it's changed, but if we have to recompute it, then we'll just redo the work because it's not worth, not worth it. We only keep the values. We sort of selectively keep what, what data to keep and what not to keep. Um, and that kind of tuning is, I think, an int it's sort of annoying that it's necessary. But uh, if you have this framework it's, or have a framework, it's nice that you can, you can do it relatively easily. So now I want to talk about a few other sort of things that happen in practice. Um, one of them is error handling. So I mentioned somewhere along the line that we, if you have errors, you, you, know, you might like to, like if you have two functions with the same name, we want to have to handle that case. And I think that in general, especially if you're in an IDE context, you really want to be handling, uh, you really don't want to stop compilation, basically ever. Right? And a lot of early compilers, I think, uh, will basically handle an error by just saying, well, OK, something's wrong. I give up. I'm done. Uh, and that's, that's a reasonably easy approach. It's probably OK for, for many projects. But it's actually, uh, but it's, it's really difficult to sort of recover. Once you've baked this strategy into your compiler, it's much harder to get it out again. And the Rust compiler had this strategy for sure for a while. And we've been slowly getting rid of it. Um, and it's been very difficult. Right? And what you can do instead that's actually not a lot harder uh, and, and much nicer, or sorry, I mean, before I get to what you can do instead, the next thing that I think you, people often try to do, which the Rust compiler also tries to do, is to say, well, there's an error. I'll report the error. And then I'm going to give back some value that's like reasonable. It has the right type but like for the compiler's type, but it's not the right value. So it might be like, I need to compute the type of this expression. This expression is bogus. I'll just give back the type integer and say, yeah, good enough. Like then and maybe you'll get some other errors down the line. but the user can figure it out. Um, and that kind of works sometimes. But it does lead to some really confusing errors to a user where suddenly the compiler is like talking about the type integer, and you have no idea why. Right? Um, so a better idea is to introduce some kind of sentinel values that say, this is bogus, basically. <laughs> this is an erroneous expression, a bad parse, whatever. And then you can just return this value. And it's not that much more work, because as long as you just have them there, then it's like almost as easy as throwing to just return this, this sentinel value. And then they're usually very easy to propagate, because you know by that, if you ever see that sentinel value, then you know that an error has been reported. So you can just kind of uh, short circuit all the other computation and just keep propagating bigger and bigger sentinels up the line. Um, and so you wind up with a, a notion where basically compilers, there is no such thing as a fallible operation. It always succeeds, but it might produce uh, an error value. And this invariant is pretty important, though. I've 
seen subtle bugs introduced where people return the sentinel value, but they haven't actually reported an error, usually because they think they know that an error will be reported by some other phase in the compiler, but then because they are, they're not wrong about that, but, but they're wrong about the ordering, and the phase actually comes later, and the phase winds up being skipped because we saw this error value, and we thought that there already was an error, so we don't want to report duplicate errors. So you really want to keep this invariant very clear that you know, you actually reported the error right there, then you can produce a sentinel value, or you got one from somebody else. Um, and then it will work much better. Uh, so this, this might be an example of, you know, just basically, whenever you make something that represents a type or whatever, just include an error in there. So now you can have integer, character, or error, and um, propagate it along. Um, and the, the thing that the main problem here is that you get to this point of sort of diminishing returns uh, of how much precision, if you really want to take this notion of an error of sentinel all the way, I mean, the goal is basically to never give users a an error that is, it, it, you don't, if, if you saw an error earlier on, you never want to report a second error related to that code because you really don't know what's happening, right, ideally. Um, however, that can be difficult, right? So if we have like this structure that stores the signature of a method, <coughs> it says here's the argument types. There's a list of types and a return type. There's a hidden assumption here, for example, that we know the arity. We know how many arguments there are in the function, but maybe we couldn't really parse the function signature. There was a missing comma or something, and we're not really sure how many arguments the user even meant for there to be. I don't know. I've tried some, in, in different versions of the compiler, I've tried to be very, propagate this all the way out, and at some point it stops being worth the trouble. So I would say, in a case like this, I would probably just say, well, you take a best guess, and if they s get an error, like I expected three arguments and you gave me two, you know, oh well. Uh, but, so it's not exactly easy, but I think if you know the right place to cut it off, it works pretty well. Um, so, yeah. Before you go further, so at the moment, when I use RC, it's very clear where the phases are. Like, if I get syntax error, I won't get any typing errors. And if I get typing errors, I won't get omission errors. Is this intended to. Yeah. Yeah. Right, that's a legacy of the older. So, what, what, so, so Rusty's. I'm kind of blurring the lines, as I said. The the this idea of never stopping is basically me saying, don't do what we did in Rusty. Uh, and when I've and, and when we've been re-implementing Rusty and we've not, and we've used the approach I'm describing here, it's been much much easier. Um, but what we do in Rusty is basically that it's some hybrid of, we don't throw the error immediately. We used to do that too. Uh, but we stop doing that usually, but we do have big phases where we sort of say, let's, if there have been any errors thus far, there's no point in going further because the data is so corrupt. Um, that is something we're trying to remove, but it is difficult because the assumptions are, uh, you know, you, it's just you don't realize what, where you've implicitly made a dependency, uh, and you have to kind of sort that out over time. So you can imagine you No, no. Yeah, the goal is to have no point like that. What instead would happen is that, let's say that you have typing errors within a function, you might not get borrow check errors for that function. Um, and maybe you will, actually, depends right on how we do it. But I think the first phase would be to, to make it much more granular and then proceed from there. I would actually like, I mean, I, I think we should be able to give you borrow check errors even in the face of type errors as long as we can sort of make some sense, you know, uh, other parts of the function make sense, so we can type those. And I don't see any reason that would be hard if, we're, if we just do it, basically. Um, what was I gonna say about that? There was, oh, I did wanna mention one interesting thing. So this actually is something we don't yet handle in Salsa, but that is related to that, which is I've been describing to you this whole thing of out of order execution and so on. But one of the problems comes up, well, how do you actually report an error to the user in the first place? Like, what, what is an error kind of in this framework? And uh, I think what I would like to do is have some sort of side effect channel for these queries. So right now, what we've done in the compilers we built on this is that they return basically, instead of saying, uh, they basically embed errors into the values they return. 
So you'll get back a type, the types of all the things in your function, and in there is a list of errors. And some other part of the framework then has to go through and sort of sweep over all the possible places errors might occur and report, collect them into one big vector and send them to the ID. And that's error prone because you can overlook an error from, from one phase or another. You, you might not remember that you have to check not only the type checker, but also the parser can produce errors and so on. Um, and so I'd like to have some sort of mechanism where they can, it's also just, so it's error prone, but it's annoying because mostly in your compiler, you just want to ignore errors, right? The whole point of this whole Sentinel approach is that you can just treat code like it's well-typed and, and sort of ignore errors for the most part unless you happen to see a Sentinel value. And th this winds up making them more visible. So what I would like to do is have some way where you can say, I signal an error and it gets accumulated and we'll, we'll basically handle all that for you in the framework itself, but we haven't implemented it yet. Um, in Rust-C, what we actually do is we just dump them to standard error. Uh, and then we have a, s and that's good because you get very fast feedback. It's bad because when you re incrementally re-execute, you want to see the errors. That's kind of the tricky part. You want to see the errors again from the, even if we didn't have to rerun the type checker, you'd like to still see the errors that resulted from the first run. So what we do is we buffer them up and we save them and we have a whole bunch of mechanisms here. So basically the flow of errors is itself something I glossed over, but it's a kind of a pain. Um, so cycles is an interesting case. So the, I mentioned that the frame, I mentioned that way back when in the beginning that if you have constants in Rust, they're not allowed to have a cyclic relationship, for example. That's a simplifying rule for us. You can imagine that it could work in some cases. Um, but in general, this framework basically can't handle cycles, right? If you ask to compute uh, a given value and it winds up needing to compute itself, that's a problem. I mean, of course, it would be a problem in a regular program also. It would recurse infinitely. Um, and what we currently do is we we take a pretty hard line in the framework where we actually basically panic, which means that in Rust, that's an exception, but it can't be caught. So it's, a pretty, it's actually not a good enough answer because you don't want your compiler to ever panic. And sometimes these cycles are kind of out of your control, right? It depends on what order the, the user created the cycle, essentially. Um, so we're extending it to allow you to permit controlled errors, but it's still a pretty harsh mechanism. Essentially what happens is if you get a cycle, we will, f we will force you to propagate back a return value that doesn't depend on the inputs. It's just like a cyclic error value that you can intercept it at some point. But, and the reason we're, we're so mean about this <laughs> is because we've noticed some problems when we were more flexible. Uh, we used to have a way to say, try to do this function. And if it's already on the stack, give me back you know, an, a signal, a none or something, an optional value, and I'll recover from the cycle. Because th there are a lot of times when you would you know, like to walk an entire graph, let's say, and if you, you have a cycle, you just want to ignore it or handle it. But it turns out that that's actually a very easy way to, s to, to get things wrong. And so let me give you an example that actually this is code that's still in Rusty today, but not configured on because it's still an experimental code, where we do it sort of the wrong way, and we have to fix it at some point before we turn it on. Uh, and it, it, it wasn't obvious to me how this would go wrong at first. So what's, what's happening here is we're doing inlining. And the way we do it in Rust-C is we have, this, we have this thing called mirror, which is our middle IR. And it's kind of a low-level IR for Rust, sort of, sort of like JVM, but a little higher level than that, or like bytecode. And we, it goes through some, some phases. Right? And the first one is we produce the unoptimized mirror. And then we produce the optimized mirror. And in between, of course, we do some optimizations on the, on the mirror. And we want to do one of those optimizations is inlining, inli uh, taking one function body, putting it into the call site. And it has some code that looked, looks roughly like this. It says, OK, if we're going to compute the optimized form of this function, let's get the unoptimized, oops, the unoptimized IR, walk over all the call sites, and get the optimized version of the function we're, we're calling. Because you don't want to inline the unoptimized one in. You'd rather have it already be optimized before you, you inline it. And, and then we'll actually do the inlining. Right? And this works fine as long as there's no cycle in the call graph. Uh, if there's a cycle, of course, then it would panic, which is not good. So we said, oh, well, we can just, um, we can, we can just use this, this recovery opt operation <laughs> 
and say, well, let's just check if it is not a cycle, then we'll inline it. Otherwise, we'll just ignore it because actually, you know, we don't have to do this perfectly. Like, when you think about it, if things are in the same cyclic component, same strongly connected component, uh, you know, th that's basically an edge case. And it was, it, it's good enough for our optimizer. We're going to give this to LLVM anyway. It's good enough for us to just handle the trees up there. We want the leaf functions to get inlined. So we tried this, uh, this version of the code. And it does indeed work. It will do, it will optimize uh, the leafs of a call graph into their callers. It won't handle the cyclic case. But the problem is, it does actually handle the cyclic case. It just doesn't handle it fully. Um, and what I mean by that is, let's suppose I have foo and bar that call one another. If I start by optimizing foo, then I'm going to try to optimize bar. And then I'm going to fail because of the cycle. And I'm going to return back. And so what will happen is I, I will produce an optimized bar, and I will inline it into foo. But I won't do the reverse. But if I start from bar, I'm going to produce an optimized foo and inline it into bar. So I'm going to get non-deterministic compilation results depending on which order I did the processing in. And that's not good. Um, <laughs> when you're doing this on-demand compilation and all this stuff, one of the key constraints that we want to produce is that you basically can't have non-deterministic results. Right? And the framework generally does, I think, ensure that, although I have not tried to prove it. Maybe I'm wrong. If one of you sees an edge case, please come talk to me. But uh, other people have proven it for similar frameworks. So that's probably true. Um, but this was a case where we, we kind of, by being too simplistic, we, we failed that. So the question is, well, how can I handle this then? What, what should I do in a case like this? Um, and one approach, the one I think we should do in Rusty at least, is that you make a sort of master query that computes the graph. Uh, and so this might, for example, compute the call graph for the entire thing you're compiling. It would walk all the functions, figure out who calls one another, and detect the cycles. And if basically, instead of having the walk be done through the framework, you're moving the walk into, into a single query. Right? And you're going to compute back out, here's the list of strongly connected components. Here's the order in which you should process them. And this is a what a lot of compilers do, of course. Uh, and if we did it that way, we wouldn't have this problem. But we have the, the, the downside is, in order to optimize any function, we have to recompute the whole call graph every time, because we haven't broken it up into sub-pieces. Um, so I don't actually have a good answer for that. I think that's a tricky problem. This is one of the cases where there's some advantages to moving from to a higher level representation of what you're doing, because you might be able to do finer grained incremental results. However, the thing I would say is that what I've observed is that uh, it's basically good enough most of the time. Because uh, you don't need to do these sort of optimizations for people when they're pressing the dot to give them completions, because you don't need to give the optimized code. Um, and when you're actually generating the code, this isn't like computing the call graph is not a big percentage of your uh, compilation time, so you can just redo it. It's okay, um, but I think handling it for when you, if you actually do want the incremental reuse, that's a little more tricky. Um, so there's a bunch of cases in Rust. The, the the thing about cycles is that the semantics of them really depends. Part of what makes it tricky it depends on exactly what you're doing, what you want to do in the event of a cycle. There's no general correct answer. Uh, well, yeah. And so, like just within Rust, we have cycles that arise besides inlining name resolution and trait resolution, and each has their own specific requirements around, like, for example, in trait resolution, sometimes it would be an, sorry, trait resolution is figuring out whether a type implements an interface or not. And there, that can be kind of complicated if you say, like, the fun this, fun this, this type implements display, but only if this other type implements display. So like a vector is, is displayable on the screen only if its elements are displayable on the screen. And they may have their own requirements, and you have to sort of evaluate this. And if there's a cycle, that basically means, normally that means no, <laughs> they do not implement display, because you want it to be acyclic. But sometimes it's OK. Um, so it, it can be tricky. Uh, so OK. Mm, next thing. So the another, another interesting problem that has arisen is how do you track the location of things in a file? Uh, so I mentioned 
a couple of times as my example, well, if all I did was edit a comment, that shouldn't cause anything to recompile, right? Um, that's sort of true, but not exactly true, because editing a comment does affect the line and column information for your data. And if you want to show an error on the screen, you need that information. Um, and so it might actually, in it, and you're probably embedding the line and column information into your AST, so it probably does actually affect your result. Uh, and one of the things, there are various ways to get around this. They kind of come back to the tree trick that I showed earlier. Uh, so, you know, what, what Rusty was doing and still is doing um, <laughs> in order to track location information was a, was a highly memory optimized representation where basically we took all the input data from all of your input files and put it in one huge string. And then we tracked with a single 32-bit number, you could sort of get a span of, of bytes within that string. Um, and usually those spans have a very short length, so we you know, tried to like use five bits for the, I don't know what it is, use some small number of bits for the length and use some of the rest of it for the location, and it works pretty well, and sometimes it overflows and we have a fallback. But that whole system like, is terrible for incremental, right? Because now if you change one file, not only did you invalidate all the location information within the file, but all the other files that are in the same big string are also changed. Um, so we've been moving to different systems. Uh, one way is don't track the spans at all, um, or keep them separate. Like, don't put them in the AST, but have a separate table that says, for a given, just for a given AST node ID, here's the span, right? And that table may completely change and be recomputed each time you parse, but all the intermediate values are just carrying around the ID of the AST node, and that's much more stable. Um, another way is to, uh, uh, you can store offsets from the previous sibling and length or things like that, but, and uh, basically trying to compute, you just need to, you, essentially all these schemes boil down to tracking enough that you can figure out the actual line and column later, but trying to uh, minimize what you're carrying around in the moment. So the, the idea, so for example, you could just carry how long, how, how long is each AST node, and then you can later walk the whole AST and figure out, well, I don't know, that doesn't tell you where it began in the file, it only tells you how, how long it is, but if you walk all the previous nodes and sum up their lengths, that'll tell you the beginning point. And that you can only do in the event of error, so maybe you don't need to do it at all most of the time. Right? Um, this is basically what it comes down to, is, is tricks like this. And exactly which one is best, I don't think we know yet. <laughs> um. So another interesting question. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. So on, uh, on the spans, if you, how do you track the spans across expansions and sugaring and non that's a good question. Um, I, sh I thought about having a slide on that, and I think I forgot. So thanks for mentioning it. Uh, so you know, the question was, how do you track the spans across desugarings and transformations? And so, so Rust has also a macro system, which is highly relevant here. Right? Um, so the spans in, in Rust are not only a, a line of text, but they also have a call stack, essentially, from, for, for tracking macro expansions across them. and we use that in a couple of different ways. Um, one of the things it's really useful for is exactly these desugarings. So the problem there is if you're desugaring, like for example, we desugar our for loops into while loops, but we don't want the user's errors to say to talk about while loops when they typed for loop, that would be confusing. So we track, we use this stack to push on and say, well, this is the span in the file where this token appears, but um, it came from a desugaring from, from, a, from a for loop, right? And that way we can customize the error message by inspecting this stack. Um, you do need to represent it. I think it's kind of this, a similar problem. So that's also part of our very compact 32-bit representation is tracking those stacks. They luckily occur kind of infrequently, so you can mostly not worry about them. Uh, I mean, you can, they can be less efficient. But, um, that's the basic idea, though, is you have to track the, the, the stack up there. Uh, 
that's what I'm about to talk about, actually. So perfect lead into the next slide. Uh, <laughs> one of the th things I think traditional compilers like basically love to throw away information right, whenever they possibly can. And I think that's a good, a nice thing to do. It makes your compiler simpler. It's better for incremental reuse, for example. But yeah, it's not always what you want. And the, a, a prime example is comments, but also white space. Uh, what the Rust compiler does right now, this is another case where we're, people are, there are different opinions about what is best, and I'm not, I don't have a firm one yet. But what the Rust compiler does is it, it has a traditional approach. It throws away all the comments and all the white space, but it keeps precise spans. Uh, and so you can sort of recover them by uh, going back to the original text, which we also have, fi finding the line and column number and sort of seeing where there are comments and, and you know, white space around it and stuff like that. And I, th I think that the Rust formatter, so uh, the code that automatically reformats your, your Rust code does use that technique. So it'll say, let me go find, in the, in the space between these two items, let me go find all the comments that were in there and parse them and reparse them. Yep. So how does something like Rust help the comments? Uh. So, doc, so we distinguish between doc comments, which are the ones that will actually show up in the formatted documentation, and ordinary comments. And doc comments are part of the compiler, and we c they're part of the AST in, in a formal way. Um, but so the, the downside of this, of course, is that you have to do this weird stuff to like recover the comments. You have to recompile. And so the other approach, I think, do I? Yeah. Um, so, so this is what I was saying that you can, uh, you can, you can sort of recover the comments and things after the fact. But there's another approach, which is, I think, well, for example, what they use in Swift and what we're trying in a different project, where you actually keep all the information. Oh, really? Wow. Okay. Uh, Okay, I'm getting close. Um, where you actually keep all the information in your, uh, in your tree. The problem is then you want to throw it away, and it's kind of annoying for all the reasons. Now you have more information than you need. Um, so what Swift does, for example, as I understand it, is they have these two layers they call red and black. A black tree is a fully contains all the details of, uh, of, the, of the comments and all the white space and so on. Actually, I think both our trees do, but, but the main thing about the black one is it doesn't have, it, it's, it's all relative to their current point. It only has, for example, the lengths of AST nodes, as I mentioned. And, it, it, and so that means it can be incrementally reused. So if you reparse and you know that there's no, been no changes in this function, you can just reuse it. Um, but then the, uh, the red tree layers on top and, and computes lazily all the other context you would need. Um, and th that's one approach, but the other one is to, do this kind of zooming out and in. And I think this is what Rusty does. This is what I think the TypeScript compiler does, if I understand, though I haven't read that source. Um, and I'm not sure which is better. I, I sort of lean towards this one myself, but I'm, I'm not sure. That is to say, leaving it out, but being able to recover it. So let's see, what else did I want to say? Yeah, not a lot more. The last thing I wanted to say is that there is also this need to handle threading. Um, when, you're s when your compiler is an actor taking messages back and forth, uh, it, it needs to be able to kind of uh, process them and, and always be responsive to the editor as it makes changes. So it's not okay to just sit there and take over the main thread and, and not answer questions. So what we do, the Salsa has a threading model basically where there's a master thread that is able to change the inputs and then there are helper threads that are only able to, to read and compute derived values. Of course, they're actually making changes in the database, but it's uh, hidden from you. And there's basically a read-write lock here. So if the master thread goes to set an input and there are still active helper threads out there, it will block until they've completed. Um, but this blocking, as I just said, is not so great because now you're not responding to the user's requests. So we have this notion of cancellation where essentially if there's a master thread wanting to change the input and you're off computing some derived value, uh, then you should panic that means it'll propagate an error, it'll unwind all the stuff, your thread will die. And while that happens, we just don't make changes to the database, basically. Um, and once all the helper threads have, have cleaned themselves up, 
uh, the master thread can make its change and we can keep going. Um, this is what you basically want to do, I think, is this kind of cancellation. The exact mechanism may vary, but that's the basic idea. Uh, so that you can, uh, you know, essentially when people are typing and they press dot and then they press backspace and then they press dot again, uh, type a little more, you can recover and handle all those things. Um, so. Yes. So what happens if they have some little some diagrams? Is that what you mean by the volume of the thread? If they have some they have to be making some transparent edits. I see, I see. Yeah, so we don't cancel it the sort of arbitrary we don't like inject a, a pen wherever it happens to be. But if if it so they're in the middle of doing some recomputation, if they happen to complete before we check for panic, we will store that like any other incremental edit. But if they panic in the middle of the function, then we just leave the, the state as it was, right? And that way, um, when you, after you apply the new diff, and then you will presumably restart those computations, they will just re-execute. Uh, uh, one other thing I didn't mention, but I'll mention here, uh, which I think is, is relevant, is when you have multiple threads, we also support many threads at once doing different things. So you can type check all your functions in parallel or whatever. But they might all need to access the same value. Um, so they might say, what is the signature of this function that they're both calling or something, right? And what we currently do, this is, a, this is one of those places where I think the, the best strategy also will depend. What we currently do is they block. So one of them wins. It computes the value of the other's block and wait for it, and then we re execute. This seems to work pretty well. We've, we've measured it. But there are many alternatives, right? Like they could both go and do the computation because it's a pure functional computation. As long as we handle the error propagation, right, we'll be fine. Um, and what you want to do probably depends on how much work that is. Like computing the signature is very cheap usually, but maybe doing the whole type check is not, so you don't really want to do it twice. Um, so I think my conclusions, as I said, I, I thought I would, uh, when, I, when I agreed to give this talk, I thought, surely by now we'll have a really great working system and I'll you know, know I think exactly what I think you should do. But I, I don't. Uh, but what I do know is you should at least start with an on-demand style, in my opinion. Uh, that, that proven to be a nice way to write, a com I think, to write the compiler. It doesn't have to be just starting with basically an on-demand style, using error sentinels, and a few other, I think those are the two big things from the beginning, I think will sort of put you in the right ballpark for building a responsive IDE. And the details of, um, and the details of even how you represent your spans, but you know, definitely stuff like optimizing your memoization and does the thread, how do you handle cancellation is less important at the end of the day and easier to add on after the fact. But those two things are, are really quite painful. Um, so that's my, my lesson. <laughs> and any final questions, I guess? Any questions? Yeah? Uh, something that was not quite clear to me is like, um, when you recover from parsing, parsing errors, but I also treat it like as a sentinel value, and you like to move on from this and do some type checking for other stuff as well. Yeah, that's a very good question. So I alighted parser error recovery. Um, Yes, so the answer is, the way you would do it is basically yes, it is also a sentinel value. So you have an AST node that is error, and it includes you know, some chunk of tokens and some information about the error usually. Uh, and in practice, there's a lot of, this is another of those things where pe people treat parsing like a solved problem, but actually you know, this is tricky. Uh, what I've seen in practice for error recovery though is that it's usually people do a pretty simple strategy and it works pretty well. Basically looking ahead for like uh, a semicolon, that's probably a strong signal or some other keyword or something that really means, like lets you reorient where you are and let the rest fall out. Um, but yeah, it's a good question. Uh, um, is on-demand quite as important for the backend? Is the on-demand as important for the backend? Uh, probably not. Yeah, so I think what we do in, in the Rust compiler, we, of course, LLVM does most of our backend compilation. So what we do is we, we do use on-demand sort of up until uh, we, we basically create the LLVM IR on-demand, but then we ship it off to LLVM and let it do its thing. Um, and at that point, yeah, you, you can just let it run. Um, 
It's also less vital for this incremental reuse, I think. And also, s the cycles and stuff gets much more complicated there. Yeah, if you can write a one-pass compiler like Turbo Pascal for your language, then maybe you should just do that. <laughs> I think that's a good point. Uh, it just often in practice doesn't turn out that simple these days. Um, so I, yeah, I think that's the bottom line. Um, uh, yeah, one last one. Yeah. Uh, so you, I think you mentioned master queries twice. It seems like this is the, the back door of how you can bring in very expensive computation, the very big computation to get into this model. So how do you decide when one of these master queries is really needed? Because I mean, I, I could just go and introduce many of these master queries, and then all of this model will probably collapse. Or uh, yeah, I think that so. I think that's correct. You could make an on-demand <laughs> program where sort of you could take the old model of do the phase on the whole program and just make a query per phase with no inputs, essentially, and you wouldn't get very much benefit, right? So it's not that the system falls down, but it's that your incremental performance is suboptimal. So maybe this would be a way to actually start off. So you set up the system with, with I don't know, for every phase a query, and then you see which queries are slow, and then you start splitting up these queries, and that's how you end up with a more organic way of Right. Um, so yeah, so setting up with some smallish number of very big queries and then rebuilding. I think that that would work fine. And we've been trying to do that also. It, it is definitely easier if you do it from the beginning, though, uh, than coming back to add it later. But, but yeah, that is a reasonable approach, in my opinion. I think the places where you really need the bigger queries are mostly around the cycles and things like that. Uh, yeah, that's where you either the cycles or sort of the produce all the errors, compile the whole program, the sort of batch compilation End, end points. Those are the two places. Um, I think you'll find that if you're doing the finer grain stuff, it's not that it's quite natural to make it like make it finer grained. And, I, and I, I'm not sure if you did the the approach of making one query per phase. You might find it kind of hard later on to slice them up. Uh, you could do it. It just might be more work than you than it would have been to do it from the beginning. Um. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.